Hello and welcome everyone. My name is uh, Michael Nobel and I'm a professor at the Faculty of Canon Law here at St. Paul University. Today's presentation uh, uh, will have a brief outlook on what is Canon Law exactly. So uh, that will help us understand the science of Canon Law itself. Oftentimes questions arise on what Canon Law is and what is its value. Ignorance or mistaken judgment left the science of canon law sometimes in the dark, although it is part of the curriculum for theological studies in the first cycle, or can be studied separately in the context of the licentiate or even the doctorate program, which we offer at our faculty here at St. Paul's. Today's presentation intends to give insights a little bit on the historical and current aspects of the science of canon law, simply a brief overview. Now, since you're participating in this presentation, see it rather this way. You may become a student at a Catholic university, St. Paul, more specifically an ecclesiastical faculty. If you're a Catholic and you study canon law, you qualify for many offices in the Catholic Church. A non-Catholic does not. There's one apostolic constitution for Catholic universities, Sapientia Christiana, and a separate one, Veritatis Gaudium, for ecclesiastical faculties, describing in detail professors, students, the curriculum, and so forth. If you come to Ottawa to study here, after three months, you obtain a quasi-domicile, with the effect you are now subject to the particular law of the Archdiocese of Ottawa-Cornwall. Now, what is particular law? Who is a legislator? What is a diocese? What is a metropolitan? What is a bishop? Registered as student, you also fall under canon law and civil regulations. For example, the personal data that the university collects from you. As priests, there are additional legal provisions applicable. If you live here in Ottawa to study on campus for two years, you live within a parochial boundaries, meaning you have a proper pastor responsible for you. If you commit a delict, then there's a proper judicial system locally in place. If you're a priest or as a layperson using the internet to publish material concerning morals and faith, well, you must have the approval from the local ordinary, meaning a priest simply cannot put his homily online. If as a religious you want to publish an article, you also must have the permission from your superior to do so. I have written some time ago a study examining the question, a professor of an ecclesiastical faculty of theology at a Catholic university publishes an article on canon law in a canonical journal and intends to use it as reference for an undergrad course that is part of the theological curriculum. Even though it seems clear and not complicated, almost every aspect of this required canonical discussion and explanation. You see, canon law is part of the ecclesial life. From its very beginning, when people decided to live together, they created rules and regulations. Basic norms were established to direct the lives of everyone. These rules were set by competent authorities, whether individually or with the consent or counsel of others, to protect the liberty of the individual and to guarantee the peace and the peculiarity of community of people. Developing societies established their norms and laws, which everyone had to follow. And the same principle was applied within the context of the church. Canon law needs to be distinguished from other legal concepts. The law of the code ought to be distinguished from human and secular law by the spirit of charity, temperance, humaneness, and moderation. Indeed, justice and equity are to be protected by the code. If we look back in time, even in the early days of the church, it became quite apparent that rules or norms wouldn't be needed to provide some sense of belonging to the group that sought to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, how can we define canon law? Maybe as a set of norms created by reason, enlightened through faith, it intends to bring order into the life of the ecclesial community. It is articulated and promulgated by those who are entrusted with the community's care, and its purpose is to serve the common good. Thus, canon law imposes obligations, that is, it establishes legal bonds from which rights and duties flow. Why is the law of the church called canon law? 
church councils were held as early as the fourth century. The goal was the cooperation of the ecclesiastical hierarchy and the preservation of the tradition and in doctrinal and disciplinary evolution. These councils were assemblies of bishops or other persons gathered to deliberate and to legislate on ecclesiastical issues. The decisions and provisions are reported in the so-called canons. The early councils were already referring to canons. Most authors do not refer to the true origin of the term canon, but refer to the early councils of the 4th century that already refer to ancient canonical laws. Therefore, canons can be understood as <clears throat> excuse me, a response to needs for regional norms in a variety of circumstances and were frequently repetitive in content in relation to canons of other councils concerned with the same problems and were occasionally inspired by knowledge of a similar enactment elsewhere. Most of the councils in the early ages were rather regional councils. The first council composed only of bishops that enacted canonical legislation for the church was the Council of Elvira at the beginning of the fourth century. The 87 canons produced are of great interest in revealing both the disciplinary issues and the organizational problems which faced the church in a critical period of the early 4th century. Following the interpretation of some authors, one can conclude that from these decisions made at the early councils, called canons, originates the terminology canon law for the law of the church. It may be more precise and correct to state that the conciliar terminology accepted a term that already existed, referring already to ancient canons, and hence it was not at early councils in the 4th century establishing canons, but rather referring to already existing ones. What is the place and role of law in the church? Looking at Lumen Gentium Article 8, it teaches that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, which is governed by the Roman Pontiff and the bishops in communion with him. This Church of Christ is a community of Christian faithful and the divine mystery, the work of the Spirit. As such, the Church, Ecclesia means gathering, uh, from its beginnings was subject to internal and natural laws that are necessary for and within the Church so that she can fulfill her salvific mission. As such, the Church is seeking for perfection th uh, throughout history, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. It has an absolute need to reach out for authentic values. Now, as you know, values are good things that can perfect the community, support its life, as well as sustain its development. Because it is an integral part of the church, canon law requires itself evolution, development, and reform to guide Christian faithful with two different kinds of norms. Some norms are born from a human need for order and ordered operations, and some norms are demanded and generated by divine revelations. These two different natures of law, being truly human and its affinity with the divine, are essential for the purpose of canon law the salvation of souls, and the common good of the church itself. Therefore, the church is a community of Christian faithful, anchored in society which makes it subject to changes and reforms. Consequently, the law of the church will change as well, if necessary. A recent example of it are the changes by the two motu proprio, Mites et Misericos Jesus and Mites Judex Dominus Jesus, on the reformed law pertaining to cases to obtain a declaration of nullity of marriage. Now, the current canon law. It would be incorrect to speak of the Church of Christ just as the Catholic Church. Even the Catholic Church is not just the one of Latin rite. It would also be incorrect to only consider Christian faithful of Latin or Roman rite, Roman Catholic since Eastern Catholics consider themselves Roman Catholic in the sense that they are in union with Rome. The Catholic Church today has two codes, one governing the Latin Church, the Codex Juris Canonici from 1983, and the other governing the Eastern Catholic Churches from 1990, 
Codex Canonum Ecclesiarum Orientalium, and one Apostolic Constitution, Predicat Evangelium, promulgated on March 19, 2022. A provision on the renewed understanding on the Church and the Catholic Church can be found in our Canon 204, Paragraph 2, as well as in Canon 7, Paragraph 2 of the Eastern Code. This norm reflects the renewed understanding and theology of the Church of Christ, of the Second Vatican Council, especially Lumen Gentium No. 8 and Gaudium et Spes No. 40. So, we have two codes for the Catholic Church. That is the Corpus Juris Canonici. Although at a first glance, both codes seem to be similar in their content, in reality, they're not. There are truly significant differences between both codes. Joe Babas, the former professor of our faculty, is certainly right, since canon law is more than simply the norms of the code of canon law. At the level of universal law, the norms of the code of canons of the Eastern churches are part of it as well. Both codes form part of one Corpus Juris Canonici in the church. For the promotion of the Corpus Juris Canonici, one cannot simply ascribe the Latin code as legislation purely for the Latin church and the Eastern code as purely for the Eastern churches. Both codes are part of the universal law of the church. Therefore, one must resist the tendency to label one or the other of the codes as their code. To the extent that the Latin and the Eastern codes belong to one body of canon law in the universal church, it can be said that they are both our codes. Although canonists are ought to learn the Corpus Juris Canonici, the codes itself need to be precise and clear for its practical application on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, the Code of Canon Law is not just a legal handbook for canonists, but a helpful tool for all Christian faithful, clerics, as well as laity. The spirit of communio of Vatican II includes the active participation of the laity in the work of the Church, and the codified law of the Church serves as practical tool for all those persons who are entrusted with the pastoral care of the faithful. Now, if we speak of canon law, it is not just the norms that we can find in the codes. There are further norms beside the universal law. That means the norms found in the code of canon law are considered universal law, meaning worldwide applicable. And in the codes of canons for the Eastern churches, they are considered common law. A proper understanding of the laws of the Eastern code, one needs to refer to canon 1493 of the Eastern code, and the distinction between particular, common, and universal law, which is unique to the code of canons of the Eastern churches. Particular law meaning for diocese, common law meaning for the patriarchal church, and universal law meaning, for example, the apostolic constitution predicat evangelium. Universal or common law can be general when the subject of the law concerns all Christian faithful, such as the fundamental rights of all Christian faithful outlined in Canons 204 to 223 in the, in the Latin Code, and Canons 11 to 26 in the Code of Canons for the Eastern Churches. Furthermore, universal or common law can be special law when it affects categories of persons, such as the laws common to all institutes of consecrated life, diocesan bishops for their particular churches, as well as major superiors of clerical pontifical institutes, together with that chapter for the Institute. The following list of examples of norms is not an exclusive list, but it is an intent to show the various areas of norms outside the scope of universal or common law found in the codes. First, we can mention particular law. Particular laws are those enacted by particular councils for their territories, such as a plenary council, a provincial council, the conference of bishops, or even by the diocesan bishop himself. Since particular law shares the same goal as the universal law, the salvation of souls and the common good, it cannot be contrary to the universal law. Canon 1493 of the Eastern Code offers an interesting definition that cannot be found as such in the Latin Code. In Canon 1493, Paragraph 2, the Eastern Code offers a definition of particular law, 
one that is not included in the Latin Code. Furthermore, it seems that particular law in the Code of Canons for the Eastern Churches goes beyond the scope of legislative power compared with the Code of Canon Law as it includes also to legitimate customs and statutes. Now, what about the canonization of civil law? Interestingly, not all matters that concern the well-being of the people of God can be regulated solely by ecclesiastical law. There are situations in which civil law may have the most appropriate and canonically and morally acceptable solutions. Hence, we have the norm of Canon 22. Similarly, there may be situations in which there is an overlapping of certain aspects of a problem which may come under either civil or ecclesiastical competence. And yet civil law itself may be able to offer a more appropriate solution. Or in certain areas, a canonical solution itself may be the most appropriate one. In view of this situation, the legislator wishes to canonize certain civil laws which should be observed in canon law with the same effects. For example, a proper administration of personal information and data protection. Another set of norms that we have are liturgical laws. This means besides the norms found in the code of canon law, there are other universal laws and norms that are not in the code itself. One category of these laws are liturgical norms, as stated in our Canon 2, as well as Canon 3 of the Eastern Code. According to Canon 2 and Canon 3 of the Eastern Code, most of the liturgical norms are not found in the codes, but they are part of the universal or common law. These laws are found chiefly in the liturgical books. Although Canon 2 speaks only of liturgical laws, leges, the principles stated in, these, in this canon also applies to liturgical norms found in the documents that are acts of executive rather than legislative power, such as directories or instructions published by the Dicastery of the Roman Curia on liturgical matters. Another category that we have are the so-called agreements and concordates. They also have force of law uh, according to Canon 3 of the um, uh, Code of Canon Law, in similar Canon 4 of the Eastern Code. This means the Apostolic See is capable of entering into various kinds of agreements, conventions, and concordates with political entities like the UN, UNESCO, or even nations. It is important to highlight that this is not an agreement or a treaty between Vatican State and such an entity but the Apostolic See itself, which is, according to Canon 361 of the Latin Code, the Roman Pontiff or the various dicasteries of the Roman Curia. Another group are the specific acquired rights and privileges. Granted by the Apostolic See prior to the promulgation of the Code of Canon Law, even though they may be now contrary to the provisions of the Code according to Canon 4, and similarly to Canon 5 of the Eastern Code. Now, the first question that arises is how can someone acquire rights? There are numerous ways by which you can uh, uh, acquire certain rights. That includes by civil law, administrative acts, judicial sentences, contracts, prescription, a promise to marry, election to office, vows, and oaths. Besides acquired rights, privileges conferred by the Apostolic See also remain unless they are expressly revoked. The privileges mentioned in our Canon 4 of the Latin Code are those favors granted by the Apostolic See, for example. A few religious orders have a centuries-old privilege of amending their constitutions without getting the approval of the Holy See. Then we have customs. The last category of special norms that have force of law, uh, customs. There are generally speaking two main categories of customs. Those enforced prior to the promulgation of the Code of Canon Law, which is Canon 5 of the Latin Code and Canon 6 of the Eastern Code, uh, and those customs that obtain force of law after the promulgation of the Code of Canon Law, Canons 23 to 28, 
or the Code of Canons for the Eastern Churches, Canons 1506 to 1509. Generally speaking, a custom of fact consists in the frequency of similar acts of a community. A custom of law is the right use, which has emerged from such a frequency by a community of Christian faithful for the community itself with the consent of the legislator. It may be defined more formally as an unwritten law introduced by an age-old usage on the part of the people with the consent of competent authority. Now, with all these different types of norms and laws that exist in the church, who is subject to canon law? This is our final question. Who is subject to canon law? Generally speaking, subject to divine, natural, and positive law is every human being. Nevertheless, especially in the context of merely ecclesiastical laws, a primary threefold distinction seems necessary. Unbaptized, baptized, and Catholic. The unbaptized subject to canon law. Besides divine law, natural or positive, there's also merely ecclesiastical law, meaning positive law set by a human legislator. Some merely ecclesiastical laws refer specifically to everyone, independent whether or not the person is baptized. For example, Canon 1476 of the Latin Code that allows anyone to lodge a petition and commence a litigation at an ecclesiastical tribunal. This is an important change to the Pio Benedictine Code from 1917, which allowed only for the Catholic party to commence a procedure. Another example of rights of unbaptized recognized in the Code of Canon Law, for example, is the right to marry in the context of a disparity of cult marriage or the possibility that anyone can baptize validly if certain conditions are fulfilled according to Canon 861, Paragraph 2. You have to observe form, materia, and intention. The second category are the baptized. Besides special norms that apply or can apply to all persons, the Code of Canon Law and the Code of Canons for the Eastern Churches contain norms that are applicable to all baptized, Catholics and non-Catholics. An example is here our Canon 204, Paragraph 1, and similar Canon 7, Paragraph 1 of the Eastern Code. No distinction is made in this norm that a baptized person is automatically Catholic, or specifically Roman Catholic of Latin Rite. Baptism has both social and individual effects inasmuch as the sacraments influence not only the relationship between God and a particular individual, but necessarily involve a specific community of faith. Through ascription, a baptized becomes a member of a specific community of faith. Nevertheless, anyone validly baptized participates in the three functions of the church, teaching, sanctifying, and governing, and each according to his or her own conditions. The third group, Catholics. Catholics of Latin Rite, subject to merely ecclesiastical laws. If we look at Canon 1 of the Latin Code, the code is intended for those baptized and ascribed to at least or at least received into the Catholic Church of Latin Rite. Canon 1 reads, the canons of this code regard only the Latin Church. This very short canon contains much valuable information. It is a profoundly theological and canonical canon that describes the nature of the Catholic Church itself. Canon 11 states that merely ecclesiastical laws are not prescribed by divine law, but purely by ecclesiastical authority. The source of a merely ecclesiastical law is the will of the ecclesiastical authority enacting and promulgating such law. Subject to these positive laws are those for whom the law are enacted. The Code of Canon Law contains, therefore, a set of basic norms in Book 2, applicable specifically to all the Christian faithful, Canons 2a to 2.23, specifically to laity, 2.24 to 2.31, to clerics, Canons 2.73 to 2.89, since according to Canon 2.07, paragraph 1, quote, by divine institution, 
there are among the Christian faithful in the church sacred ministers, who in law are also called clerics. The other members of the Christian faithful are called laypersons. Three conditions are outlined in Canon 11. Valid baptism, sufficient use of reason, and seventh year of age completed. In order to be bound by merely ecclesiastical laws, these conditions must be present in a person. That brings us to the last main topic, the juridic capacity of physical persons. There are various situations determining the juridic capacity of physical persons that depend on natural as well as voluntary causes. The code recognizes in particular the following five factors that you can see here on the screen. First, age. Age has a determining influence on the ecclesial juridic capacity of persons. Not anyone or anyone who has not completed seven years of age is called an infant and has no personal responsibility for his or her actions. A person not yet completed the 18th year of age is considered a minor. And a person who has reached the age of majority, 18 years complete, has the full exercise of rights. The second category, use of reason. Sufficient use of reason is required for a person not only in the context of the exercise of rights, but also in the context of fulfillment of obligations. A minor after infancy is presumed to have sufficient use of reason as well as an adult. But those who lack habitually, not temporarily, the use of reason by law are not responsible for one's actions and are legally equated with an infant. The third aspect, residency or domicile. With a domicile or quasi-domicile, a person acquires their own pastor, meaning their own diocesan bishop or eparch, and a parish priest, and is subject to the competency of the ordinary. In the context of being subject to ecclesiastical laws, a person is bound by their own particular law, and in case, in, in case a person travels outside his or her particular church, subject to certain particular laws of the particular church, where the person currently travels. Number four, relationship. The relationship of a person with other persons has a notably influence on the juridic capacity of a person, since a special bond that can exist between two persons can prohibit someone from exercising certain rights. For example, marriage impediment, appointment to ecclesiastical office, adjudicating a marriage case, and so forth. The Code of Canon Law recognizes four different types of relationship. We call them consanguinity, affinity, spiritual relationship, as well as legal relationship. The last and the fifth aspect, ecclesial right. The matter of ecclesial rights and inscription into a church sui juris is regulated in the Code of Canon Law in Canons 1111 to 1112 and Canons 20 to 34 in the Eastern Code. These two canons of the Code of Canon Law recently underwent some changes with the apostolic uh, letter issued motu proprio, De Concordia Intercodices, by Pope Francis on May 31st, 2016. Canon 1111, uh, 111, excuse me, deals with the situation that a person is ascribed to a ritual church and becomes subject to the merely ecclesiastical laws of that ritual church. Canon 112 of the Latin Code describes the conditions and circumstances for a person to be ascribed into another church, so yours, other than the Roman Catholic Church. In these cases, consequently, a person is no more subject to the canons of the Code of Canon Law, but the canons as found in the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches. Now, a brief summary. As you can see, the Church has the capacity to enact its own laws whether at the universal level or at the local level. Various factors determine when you are bound by the laws, especially particular laws. The laws of the church cannot be categorized as, well, general laws, laws for the people, church structures, teaching office, penal and procedural laws, as you find them in the codes. There are many other types of norms in the church that have force of law. To know what laws are applicable for you, you need to consult not only universal law, but also particular laws. 
When you study canon law, you will receive a profound overview on various areas of the law itself, taught by a subject matter expert. Myself, I'm an expert in general norms, procedural law, jurisprudence, as well as the use of social media in the context of teaching office of the church. To give you further examples, my doctor students work on uh, a dismissal of a member from a religious institute, uh, um, Juris Pontifici, according to the Eastern Code. Uh, second uh, study currently is the participation of the lay faithful in the Tria Munera of the Church at the parish level, with special reference to the amendments uh, to the instituted ministry of the lay faithful. Uh, another thesis is on the transparency and accountability in relation to the procedural law of, this, of the church, special consideration to the public interest and the public good. Uh, a fourth study, uh, doctor thesis currently in project is on the church data protection regulations and another one on the public scandal in the context of permanent deacons. So you see it's a large variety of topics. Our faculty, well, offers various programs, from graduate certificate diplomas on certain relevant topics, such as administration, tribunal procedures, or safeguarding in the context of abuse of minors and vulnerable persons. Then the licentiate in canon law, for which you must have some theology to be admitted, which is composed of many courses covering the entire code of canon law and the code of canons of the Eastern churches. And yes, also the doctorate in canon law, where you dedicate a few years of your time to write a thesis on a specific canonical issue. As you can also see, we have two centers attached to our faculty, the Center for Canonical Services and the Center for Safeguarding Minors and Vulnerable Persons. We also offer each summer legal education, a program specifically for religious. We have dedicated staff from recruitment, admission, the registrar, all for St. Paul University, uh, uh, as well as uh, faculty, staff, professors included. For most of you, the director for graduate studies will be the main person of contact. If you browse on our website, you also see the full-time professors we currently have, as well as their area of expertise. With that being said, I hope to welcome you to one of our programs in Canon Law, and I'm looking forward to maybe see you soon at our faculty. Thank you very much.